All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Art on Thursdays pre presents um, Norman Rockwell on Art. America's favorite illustrator is best known for his relatable scenes of modern American life with subjects selected for their broad appeal, families, holiday celebrations, and young love. Rockwell was also fond of making paintings about painting and the art world in general, topics one wouldn't necessarily associate with commercial art for the middle class. This program considers the various ways Rockwell explored art making in museums over the course of his career with a healthy dose of the artist's good humor. Our host today, Jane O'Neill, is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served, executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. For more information, visit IamCulturallyCurious.com, and I'll put that in the chat so people can look that up. All right, without further ado, Jane, you can take it away. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Julia. Yeah. You might have to, yep, yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. It is sort of a rainy, overcast night in Manchester, New Hampshire. So I hope where you are, you are um, warm and dry and sort of snuggled up and ready to relax because we're in for like such a pleasurable treat over the next hour looking at the artwork of Norman Rockwell. And we've got this great image on the screen. This is a self portrait uh, uh, by Norman Rockwell of him painting one of his beloved paintings called The Soda Jerk. We'll look at it a little bit later on. Um, but today's program is going to be focused on how Norman Rockwell depicted art art making and art historical references in his works throughout his career. And I think it comes as a surprise to a lot of people because we think of him as purely focusing on um, the kind of misadventures of the American middle class throughout the 20th century. We don't necessarily think of him as an artist who made art about art, but it was Mark Twain that said, write what you know. And I think when it comes to Norman Rockwell, he was painting what he knew. So he's uh, essentially inserting these aspects of his profession, of his career, what he knows, into his paintings throughout his career. And he does that with the good humor and with, um, with, with, with a great deal of sweetness too. So let's just get started very quickly with a reintroduction to Norman Rockwell. You're probably here tonight because you're already familiar with the artist. He's a household name, right? We see him over here on the left in a study for his famous triple self portrait from 1960. And um, over here on the right, we see his famous painting, The Freedom from Want from 1943, part of the Four Freedoms series. So uh, just uh, some, some brief biographical notes on Norman Rockwell. He was born in 1894 and he died in 19. 78. So a nice long life there. And um, really saw all of these innovations of the 20th century and revolutions in the art world during this nice long life. Now he worked as a commercial illustrator his entire life. By that I mean he was creating works of art, oil paintings for commercial purposes, for calendars, for magazine covers, for cards, and of course, uh, the way we know him best as is as the illustrator for the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. He worked for that publication for almost 50 years. So um, pretty incredible. Uh, for uh, the Saturday Evening Post alone, he created a more than 320 paintings. So he was prolific. And I, I would say almost every single one of his paintings really hits a special note in terms of resonating with the American public. Now we think of him as this chronicler of the middle class, as somebody who painted American life. And this idea I think is kind of grounded in this image that we see over here on the right. Uh, this is the freedom from want, a big idea here, but it's a multi-generational family gathering, probably a Thanksgiving celebration. And it's something that I think almost everybody can sort of relate to in some way or aspire to in, in another way. And now at this point, it's like we sort of 
um, mark our own holidays and traditions with the goalposts that Norman Rockwell created throughout the 20th century. So incredibly relatable works. Now, Norman Rockwell, I would argue, was sneaking in the art all along. And I wanted to share this image on the right from 1937 called The Antique Hunter to give you a little bit of a preview in terms of how he would do this. We see a woman here, a very uh, happy shopper, and she is, um, her arms are full of all of these treasures that she just got at auction. She's got a sculptural bust here. She's got a framed portrait. She's got this red portfolio under her arms, presumably filled with uh, uh, sketches and prints and all sorts of things. And she's happy because she's she's gotten a deal on these treasures. And even if you're not necessarily one to go out and look for antiques, you can certainly identify with this sense of satisfaction and joy that she has in this moment. So this is just one of the ways Norman Rockwell kind of spoon feeds the, this content to us. So let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together. I've broken the program up into these six categories. Everyday artists, Norman Rockwell showing us people who aren't necessarily professional artists, but in some ways are making marks. And then we'll turn our attention to actual artists, people using easels, people using the kinds of materials that Norman Rockwell would have used himself. And I should mention too, these are his actual brushes, brushes that we see over here from his studio uh, that you can go and visit in Stockbridge, Massachusetts and notice just how clean they are. He was fastidious. Our next section here is about museums and fine art. And I love this section because once again, when you're thinking about the American middle class, you're not necessarily thinking about somewhat elitist institutions like art museums, but Norman Rockwell, he, he works he works it in there and he makes it fun. And then this section uh, called Pictures Within Pictures is Norman Rockwell actually quoting other artists' work and inserting it into his own work. So some art historical references there. And then we have um, true art historical references in that he's not copying one work, but he's he's creating an image that's inspired by something else in the art world. Okay, so plenty to cover here. Let's dive right into everyday artists. Okay, so Norman Rockwell, uh, as an artist himself, could find uh, opportunities to sort of relate to other artists, everyday people in what they were doing that uh, sort of um, referred to his own profession. So I have these two images here and this little girl always makes me smile. This is a painting from 1922. It was for the cover of Literary Digest magazine. And I bring this in for the simple idea of making marks and, and the idea that Norman Rockwell would probably relish the opportunity to kind of put the paintbrush in somebody else's hand or the tube of, of lipstick in somebody else's hand um, and imagine how they might make, make marks. So he is really kind of playing with this idea of who else can be an artist in his work. So the little girl kind of here missing the mark, being a little messy with the rouge and the lipstick, but uh, once again, a, a really sort of satisfied expression as she peers at her reflection down her nose. Over here on the left is a painting from 1940 called The Hitchhiker. And with this work, we can see uh, sort of a lazy or sort of unmotivated young man who is hitchhiking, but he's not even sticking his own thumb out. He's painted um, a hand with a thumb out and his uh, desired destination on the side of his leather suitcase. <laughs> now there's all sorts of wonderful details here. I just love that his socks are so threadbare. You can actually see his toes and the bottoms of his feet through them. And we can also see that even though there's um, just a spare amount of detail here, that he is kind of surrounded by, um, by autumn leaves. So the weather's changing, it's getting colder, and he just wants to get someplace warmer. But he's not super motivated to, to get there. He's, he's waiting for a good ride. Now, notice he's also strumming a ukulele while he waits. And if you have really good eyes, you might notice that he's also painted the edges of the ukulele. So, um, so Norman Rockwell is creating um, a real character here that that has picked up a, a brush in, in multiple instances to, to give us a sense in terms of who he is and, and where he might be going. 
Now, our next everyday artist I wanted to share with you is this little guy here. This is called Painting the Little House from 1921. So this is still very early in Norman Rockwell's career. And we see this young boy hard at work painting this giant birdhouse that looks very much like a dollhouse in some ways, right? It's huge, but it's got these little perches for the bird. And, um, and you can probably see how Norman Rockwell has made this distinction between the roof of this house that has already been painted red, and then this new um, sort of uh, uh, wet and kind of glistening red paint that the little boy is applying. Some of it is even kind of dripping down between these gables here. So we get a real sense of like the materials, the viscosity of the paint, and we have the this wonderful expression on the boy's face, how he's kind of sticking his tongue out as he is focusing on this job. We notice that there's red paint on his forehead, on his nose, on his hands and arms. And then we notice that there's red paint all over the space that he's in. Um, and even references to other painting projects. This adorable little puppy who might have a little bit of red on, hi on his nose too, takes our eye back to this back wall where we can see this young man has also painted a face on a kite and painted a face on, on the back wall here. So we get the sense that this is a young, industrious, creative boy, no doubt somebody that uh, Norman Rockwell would have sort of felt a kinship to. This next image here alongside the painting is probably a publicity photo uh, sort of staged to show Norman Rockwell with his inspiration here. And I think you might just find it interesting that uh, Rockwell once said, if a painting isn't going well, just add a puppy and an injured foot. So you'll notice that this little boy has a bandage on his big toe here. Might give us a sense in terms of uh, how satisfied he was with this particular uh, painting. Now, another painting from the 1920s that is an everyday artist, in this case, a little boy who isn't necessarily like a professional artist, but he's got a, a paintbrush, he's got a can of paint, um, a little bottle of water over here, several paintbrushes, in fact. And his canvas is his little sweetheart's uh, giant green raincoat. And the title of the work is She's My Baby. And that's exactly what he's painted on her back in this block uh, lettering. And now he's adding in two overlapping uh, hearts. And we can see once again how Norman Rockwell has changed the appearance of this red paint to indicate the red paint that has dried and the red paint that's still wet and on the brush here. I think that's just truly amazing. Now, the inspiration for the title of this work, She's My Baby, is um, the popular movie that was out at the time. But I also think that perhaps this is a little bit more about Norman Rockwell's actual life. We're going to zoom out just for a moment to give a little bit more context. Uh, you'll notice as we're looking at this piece that this little boy is wearing these giant shoes, shoes that would have been way too big for him to walk in. And maybe his sweater is just a little bit too big too. Notice how it's kind of flipped up a bit. The pants seem a little bit billowy here, but it's really this hand that he's kind of using to steady himself on this little girl's back that doesn't seem um, right for a child, right? It's got a pinky ring. There's a watch here. Now, um, some art historians theorize that perhaps this is more like a self-portrait of the artist because in fact in the year 1927 when this was painted Norman Rockwell's first marriage was kind of coming to an end it was um, an unsuccessful marriage and and perhaps this was kind of his his last sort of valentine to his to his wife at the time so certainly uh, a, an opportunity to consider a, a potential self-portrait in this work now, our next everyday artists are uh, figures who aren't even using paint. <laughs> In this case, we're going to look at a couple of ads for varnish that Norman Rockwell took on in the early 1920s. And this whole series, I believe the original oil paintings that he created for them are in the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo, New York. So over here on the left, we have a workman in these white clothes. And you can see that he is in the process of varnishing up this floor here, making it shine and look so nice. But the little girl 
presumably the girl who lives in the house where he is working, has approached him with her doll bed. And so he's taken that bed, used his varnish and his brush and has shined it up for her or is considering shining it up for her. But notice how the paintbrush in this case sort of unifies the man, the girl, and points us in the direction of that doll bed. Um, this is Norman Rockwell and great storytelling right off the, the bat, but these associations with painting are really what's coming out here. And you have the same effect with this other wonderful painting about varnish over here on the right. This is a work called Grandpa's Gift from 1920. So here is Grandpa still formally dressed up in an attic setting. You can see the eaves here, uh, or the slanted roof, I should say. And he has taken out his varnish so that he can shine up this cradle that's been up in the attic. So you can imagine that Grandpa just got the good news that, um, that there's a, going to be a new addition to the family. And he's doing this kind of dutiful, loving work up in um, up in the attic, but it's really using a paintbrush in order to do that. So it's that close association with the kinds of things that Norman Rockwell did, did all day long. One last varnish ad for you. This one, um, two men in what sort of seemed like a, um, a, a storeroom here that's filled with cans of paint and paintbrushes throughout, but it's the older man who's holding the floor varnish in his hand, sort of um, passing along some wisdom to this younger man who's sitting um, on a much too small box. And the title of this work is Master and Apprentice. So the seasoned expert when it comes to floor varnish is passing on his wisdom to this young, uh, uh, young upstart. But it's this terminology master and apprentice that brings us right back to the world of art here. So Norman Rockwell playing up all these associations or perhaps kind of leaping from his associations in order to create an image that might resonate with others. But for the most part, Rockwell was able to find humor in working with paint. So this is a picture called uh, Spilled Paint, the Road Line Painter's Problem from 1937. So we have our protagonist here. We sort of see him, well, we see his rear end first. He's bent over, but he's uh, carrying a pail of white paint that's kind of sloshing out. And he's got this huge paintbrush. His work is the work that Norman Rockwell is, is best familiar with, but he's got a more mundane application for this paint. He's just painting lines in a road. We can see the edge of the sidewalk here, but it's so quiet in this little town. Um, it's dogs and cats who are running around who are making a mess of, of the lines that he is painting here. And of course, this is something to make, this is a little story, a little narrative that I, I think most Americans could really relate to because who among us hasn't had some chaos in their houses from dogs or cats or, or young people. <laughs> so we all know what it's like to have some sort of detail oriented work that is just completely disrupted by animals or children. So Rockwell making uh, artists uh, 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 and, and the work of, of applying paint so relatable. It's nothing that seems like it's from um, another realm or an elitist realm. All right, our next everyday artist is the circus artist. This is from 10 years later, 1947. And I think this is a really interesting, it's very complex work for Norman Rockwell. Uh, in the foreground, we see this kind of striking silhouette of this carousel horse who is still attached to the carousel. And then in the middle ground, we have another carousel horse that has been removed from the carousel. And this uh, bald uh, artist here with a few cans of paint and some paint brushes is not just shining it up, he's uh, applying a whole new color to this, this, this horse, um, making it much more visually striking. And then we have just behind him, these three little boys, um, who uh, seem really sort of interested in what this artist is doing. He doesn't seem like he necessarily wants the company, but Norman Rockwell has gone beyond that too. He's added in this figure in the background in a painted setting, a painted stage, this Amazonian woman, this bare-breasted woman who's fighting these man-eating snakes. 
And maybe there's one little boy who's kind of interested in her, but these two other kids are really interested in the creative process and in applying paint to, to in this case, a horse. And I think a lot of people who have um, worked as artists in some way know um, how the average person can just get really caught up in watching that process unfold. So Rockwell's sort of making a commentary on that. We'll, we'll see, we'll see sort of gawkers like this again uh, in uh, the not too distant future. But for now, let's turn our attention to a wartime scene that Norman Rockwell created. And in this case, the everyday artist that he has depicted is a tattoo artist. This is 1944. And now we, the viewer, are the people who are hanging out behind the artist, kind of gawking over what he's doing. So here is the rear end of that tattoo artist. He's leaning over to carefully uh, um, apply the name of yet another woman to this sailor's arm. He's already crossed out a few other women's names. I can see Mimi and Olga and Rosie Rosietta, Ming Fu and, um, and some others, but now he's adding the name Betty. And even the sailor here looks a little bit nervous as to whether or not this is, you know, things with Betty are going to last here. So in this case, we've got a human canvas that, that the artist is working on. But, um, but Rockwell gives us sort of the tools of the trade here. And then I imagine he probably had a great time thinking about making this catalog of other images um, for a sort of a backdrop to this setting here. Now, this next everyday artist is as close to a professional artist as you can get. This is a sign painter. This was done in 1935, so it's the midst of the Great Depression. Notice that our sign painter is this scrawny little guy. And once again, we see him from behind. Uh, we also notice that there is a big hole in the bottom of his shoe. So this is somebody who's also kind of struggling financially. So he is sitting on this bowed board. You almost get the sense that he got this job because he won't break the board, but he's surrounded by a can of paint, all these paintbrushes and a reference image over here. And he is carefully applying paint um, he's already created this beautiful kind of elegant outline of this uh, lovely woman and is applying the detail of her eyes here. Just below her face is the is the lettering for the word kiss. So, um, so there's this kind of playfulness with an image like this where we imagine somebody who's young and poor and sort of like the 90 pound weakling uh, um, almost uh, uh, engaging with somebody who looks so elegant. Now he is aspiring in so many ways. He's even wearing a little beret here, but it seems as though he's not quite wearing it right. It's kind of hanging off his back here. So it's Norman Rockwell kind of playing up uh, opposites in, in, in so many ways to create a humorous effect. Now uh, you can't leave everyday artists without, uh, without touching on one kind of working class figure that everybody's familiar with. And that is of course, St. Nicholas. <laughs> so if Norman Rockwell is tasked with creating a cover of the Saturday Evening Post that is going to feature Santa, why not make Santa an artist as well, a painter? But in this case, he's an exhausted painter. He's got so much work to do, all these children. So um, in this case, the, the paint job that's sitting in his lap is uh, getting finished by all of these busy elves who are also hoisting up the cans of paint and all of that. Now, I just want to briefly note that these two lines here and this kind of circle format, this was something that was a part of the Saturday Evening Post mastheads um, early on in the in the first decade or, or two of, of Rockwell's career. So he often kind of had to work with that in order to shape his compositions. And probably worth noting too, that this, this seems like we've come kind of full circle from the little boy who's painting the red roof over here to now the elves over on the right. Now let's turn our attention to Rockwell when he focuses in on painting other painters, real professional artists, or at least aspiring professionals. What does that look like? Well, 
in Rockwell's early career, he was um, particularly interested in creating scenes about American history. He grew up listening, listening to his father read him Dickens. He had this fascination with the past. And so he amassed this huge collection of colonial era um, clothing and objects. And a great number of his early works focused on American history. So this is a painting called Pipe and Bowl Sign Painter from 1926. And this is a really special cover for the Saturday Evening Post because this was um, the first time they were using a new four color printing process, which allowed for more accurate representations on the cover, uh, more accurate representations, I should say, the artist's original paintings. So of course, Rockwell's given this opportunity, and of course he's going to paint another painter hard at work. In this case, our painter doesn't have an easel. He's probably, you know, it's early America. He's probably an itinerant painter. Uh, so he's using the back of this chair. And even though Rockwell's captured all of these wonderful details, about the wrinkles and the face and, you know, the folds and this big billowing shirt and how his, his socks are sort of falling down, notice that the painter himself is um, rendering this sort of simplified view of this, of this wigged figure here who has a pipe in his mouth and is holding uh, a glass of wine. Interestingly, Norman Rockwell usually gives the pipe to the artists. So Rockwell returns to this theme of a colonial era painter um, about 10 years later. And this is just called Colonial Sign Painter from 1936. And, um, with this work, we can see it's it's the, the exact same concept, uh, a, an early American painter, presumably somebody that wasn't trained, somebody who just, um, just had a, a natural sort of instinct and inclination to create paintings, who was hired to do functional objects like sign paintings. In this case, he's kind of cranking out these uh, George Washington's inspired signs, and he's doing it outside. And so all of these figures are coming up behind him so curious about what he's doing. Once again, the creative process is drawing curious onlookers and maybe even some um, uh, creating some, uh, 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 garnering some unsolicited feedback as, as he's hard at work. I think what's so great is we saw that circus painter earlier notice that some, that the little boy here is, um, is sort of standing in the exact same position as, as some of these onlookers in the colonial sign painter. So, um, so this motif of, of people kind of approaching an artist hard at work is one that Rockwell uh, returns to, we'll see. But this next work that I wanted to show you is the first time we see a little girl with, with real art, artist tools in her hands, not just lipstick. So this is a painting called The Artist's Daughter that was painted in 1922 um, for Literary Digest. And it's interesting, they actually named the painting because Norman Rockwell didn't have any children at the time that he painted this, and he never had a daughter. So they just imagined that the setup here, that a young girl would sort of take on these kind of oversized tools, the oversized palette and ball stick and, and paintbrush in order to paint or in order to attempt a, a rendering of a portrait of her doll. So we see her um, looking very focused, very determined, but with a kind of cartoonish output, but still very respectable for a young girl, right? So Rockwell returns to this motif of, of young girls painting with a great deal of, of focus and sincerity in their work. He returns to the several times Times. I love this painting called Hayseed Critic from 1921, where we see this young girl and um, notice that she's working outside. There's like this little mound of grass that she's sitting on. The French would call that en plein air. So she's not cooped up in an artist studio. She's got her little artist box here that she's using as, as a, an easel. Her hands are filled with these um, brushes and there's still some more of her equipment at her feet. Now, um, because she's outside, it sort of invites the opportunity for more curious onlookers. And in this case, a man who um, maybe doesn't often get the chance to see someone hard at work creating a painting like this. So we have a, a, a man who seems more like a farmer or somebody who isn't, uh, it isn't as interested in aesthetics as this young woman. So we see he is wearing a straw hat, sort of beat up. We see he's got, you know, patches on his pants and, um, 
and he's hunched over this young girl. She is, she's got the, you know, the thin line of, of this brush in her hand. She's, uh, she's doing, she's creating, and he's got the thin line of this straw sticking out of his mouth. So he's, he's just talking and Rockwell gave him the title of critic. So we get the sense that he's there offering some feedback on her work that maybe he's necessarily qualified to do. Now, once again, this is a study of opposites for humorous effect. We have young versus older. We have sort of soft and curved versus hard and angular. Um, but uh, I mean, even just notice how angular his jaw is, the fact that Rockwell included this stick behind him too. There's all these straight lines as opposed to her curved lines here. But notice how Rockwell gave her this little red scarf and, um, and kind of matched it or paired it with the red handkerchief sticking out of his pocket. So sort of marrying these two figures together. But it's really the study of opposites that makes this picture kind of fun and, um, and, and funny to look at. So the next artist I wanted to share with you, the next painting about painters by Norman Rockwell is I think a favorite for so many. This one's called Wet Paint and it's from 1930, so about a decade later. We have another young female artist, presumably a teenager, young teenager, uh, but somebody who seems really uh, dedicated to their work, so much so that as she was working outside, uh, she became unaware uh, of the fact that a storm was coming in. So the circle motif behind her that was part of the, the masthead of the Saturday Evening Post shows this rainy weather. And we even get a few raindrops coming into the space that she occupies here. And she is um, trying to escape this stormy weather. She didn't even have time to pack up all of her paintbrushes and palettes here. She's just tucked her easel under her arm and she's making a dash for it. Her beret has fallen off her head. And I think Norman Rockwell might have even gone back in and added like more billowing smock here. It almost seems as though this line might have ended right here and that he might have added a little bit more um, smock to add to the drama of this. So a um, little bit of a play on words here too because uh, her painting is not yet dry. She's trying to save the painting. So the, the term wet paint it uh, plays off of the fact that that uh, her still uh, wet painting could get uh, even wetter by by the uh, the weather, and uh, and we see this wonderful determination in her face, um, the seriousness with these glasses. There's a little bit of, of green paint on her cheek as she's clutching this paintbrush in in um, in her mouth, and these other paintbrushes and the palettes were actually uh, Norman Rockwell's. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I wanted to share with you a painting that's not just about a young woman and her and her paint supplies. This is probably Norman Rockwell's most complicated composition that he ever created for a cover of the Saturday Evening Post. This is a picture called Roadblock from 1949. And the basic setup here is that we're in an alleyway and this little bulldog is creating quite a commotion because this big box truck can't get through the alley because he won't move. So there's all these figures who have come outside or have stopped their own cars or stopped what they're doing in order to um, laugh or agonize over the presence of this dog. So uh, as I said, it's a complicated uh, composition. There's more than 20 figures here. And notice how Rockwell created uh, and, and placed all of these figures in the composition to kind of draw our attention down to that dog. All of these perspectival lights lead your eye back to uh, the star of the show here. And I would argue that the figure who it, who's, has the kind of strongest gesture in this painting is this figure over here. Now this is an artist and wouldn't it just make sense that uh, Rockwell, if he's gonna create this little slice of life in this community here, that he would add in an artist. He's an artist, he thinks an artist is a part of every community. So let's zoom in on that artist. I love these details here. 
um, you can see just how remarkable uh, Norman Rockwell's work is. If, if nothing else, just appreciate all the colors that he added into the brick in the background. It's just beautiful. But in this case, this artist was one of his friends who was an artist. He was a teacher at the Los Angeles County Art Institute. And in this case, he's got his, his paintbrushes, his palette, and not only is he pointing at the bulldog, but he's extending his arm even further by um, pointing with a paintbrush in this case. He has some other sketches and drawings um, pinned up on that open window. And he's accompanied by this lovely blonde who seems to be only clad in like this pink sheet here that's just kind of holding to her chest. Notice in her other hand, there is a cigarette. So is she the model? Is she the lover? Is she both? I love this painting because Norman Rockwell is, um, is inviting us to not just laugh at the scenario of this bulldog uh, blocking the alley, but he's even inviting us to speculate and think about the lives of all these people and what they were doing just before um, their day was interrupted by this big commotion. Now, what's also kind of fun about this painting is that Norman Rockwell included a self-portrait here. So we can see him at the top of the painting, leaning out of this window with a violin underneath his arm. He's in, in this case, he's the music instructor and he painted one of his sons over here with his violin case who is unable to, to get to his lesson because of this roadblock here. Now, as we leave this section about painting painters, I wanted to include a few Norman Rockwell self-portraits just because he, he painted so many of them throughout his life and, and they really changed depending on sort of where he was in his career. So, um, so this certainly isn't all of them, but it gives us a, a little bit of, of um, a sense of, of that uh, 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 of that variety. So we start over here in 1938 with a painting called Blank Canvas. We see Rockwell from behind. It's the motif that he loves so often when he's painting painters. And here he is sitting in front of a big canvas and he is creatively blocked. He has no idea what he is going to paint for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. So he ends up just painting himself with a creative block. So here he's like this young gangly man. You almost get the sense that he hasn't really cut his teeth yet in the art world. Although of course the painting itself is, um, is, is wonderful in so many ways. By 1953, we can see that wonderful self-portrait that we started with tonight. Um, Norman Rockwell has painted his, himself in this self-portrait, um, actively working on one of his other notable works, uh, 1953's The Soda Jerk. So he clearly loved that painting so much he, he needed to portray it all over again. And he's portraying himself as this serious and methodical practitioner of, of of, of painting. So, so we've got a, a great deal of experience and, and more respect really for his, himself and his role as we move along. And then over here, the second image from the right, this is a painting called Beyond the Easel from 1966. Rockwell had a six decade long relationship with the organization Boy Scouts of America and often created uh, calendar images for them. So here he's painted himself out in a field with several Boy Scouts and he's standing at his easel. And at this point in his career, he is painting himself as a seasoned expert, um, someone who really knows what he's doing and has a level of comfort even uh, painting outdoors. And in, in this case, he's not showing us his canvas, but he's kind of showing us everything else that's happening around him. And then this final work here, one of his um, uh, much later images, this is from 1976. It's uh, the Bicentennial. And this is the 4th of July cover for American Artist Magazine. So he's painted his self-portrait here. And he is it's not just the expert, he is an icon at this point, just two years before his death. And he's painted himself alongside another American icon, the, uh, the Liberty Bell here. Now, of course, what's What's missing is his uh, incredible self-portrait, the triple self-portrait, but we'll be getting to that in just a moment. So we're going to uh, 
switch gears and take a look at Rockwell's uh, paintings about museums and the world of fine art. Now, if somebody were to challenge you right now to say, let's create an image that uh, middle class Americans could really connect with and resonate with, I don't think any of us would, you know, think ding, 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 I'm going to paint an art museum. But that's what Norman Rockwell did. And, and he did it several times throughout his career. Um, so I wanted to start off with this wonderful painting from the early 1940s called No Smoking. This is from 1944. And in it, uh, maybe we're not necessarily in, um, in a museum setting, but we have a very formal portrait. Uh, we, we have a, a portrayal of a fire chief who sort of tucked it, his, his hand into his jacket, sort of Napoleon style. And, um, and there's this big elaborate ornate uh, gilded frame surrounding the picture but it almost seems as it's as though it's over a mantle and um, and resting on the mantle of course the joke here is that there's a cigar and the smoke from the cigar is um, is not just um, uh, kind of making its way up up the center of the picture here but you can actually see that it's being inhaled by the figure in the painting. And of course, there's this horrible look of disdain. He's so worried that this is going to cause a fire. So what's happening here, this is a motif that Norman Rockwell loves, uh, a very playful motif where he brings a work of art to life. And, um, and who among us doesn't love this idea of like, you know, the paintings and sculptures taking on a life of their own um, beyond the static image in, in the frame or on a pedestal. So um, so this is, it, it's, it's a motif that's kind of as old as time. Uh, you can see it in, in Harry Potter movies where, you know, paintings are talking and that sort of thing. So it's, it's one that Rockwell returns to in just a few years later. Uh, this is from 1946. It's a painting called Framed. And now we are certainly in a museum setting. We can see uh, various paintings on the wall. We have a little uh, uh, pedestal here with a nude figure, a sculpted nude figure. And we have a museum worker, um, somebody in this kind of worker's clothes. And he is uh, engaged in the process of just moving this frame. And because the frame is an empty frame, and the way he's holding it, it's framing him. And, uh, and it's sort of humorous because once again, he's a worker. He's somebody who's working class, not somebody that you would necessarily see um, depicted uh, in a picture hanging on a museum wall. But he's uh, kind of perfectly placed. It's like this uh, profile bustling portrait here. It, it just... Um, it, it just works. <laughs> but Rockwell pushes it one step further. It's not just about framing up somebody who wouldn't necessarily be uh, portrayed in, in, um, in a painting on a museum wall. He makes it so that the other paintings seem to be responding to this. We have a Renoir like nude here who is sort of shyly looking over at this figure with the frame. We have a figure that looks like he's a revolutionary era soldier looking down with some concern, maybe some disdain. And then just beyond this figure who's carrying the frame, we have this scowling face of, of uh, a man who looks like he's sort of a Renaissance era um, painting. And you almost get the sense that he's mad that his view is getting blocked here. So paintings coming to life. One last image uh, here that, that I wanted to share with you. This is an image called The Art Critic. This is from 1955. So it, this is like Rockwell's golden years, right? The 1940s and 50s, where we see him returning to the subject again and again. Uh, we are most definitely in a museum setting. Uh, and our art critic is actually, I always sort of understood him as, as an art student. He's got an art artist palette here. He's got um, his art box with his paints and he's got his easel all folded up. Um, in his hand behind his back is his museum guide. And in his other hand in front of him is a magnifying glass. And he's using that magnifying glass to closely examine the brushwork on the painting in front of him, sort of a Rubens-esque uh, portrait of a woman. He's looking very carefully at some jewelry that is 
uh, on her bosom. And she seems to be quite enjoying this close in examination. He doesn't seem aware of the fact, but, um, but she's got her eyebrows arched. She's sort of smiling there. And then even the other painting, this group of three bearded gentlemen, um, seem almost uh, upset uh, uh, um, at this intimate act that's taking place over here on, on the left. And of course, just to emphasize that, that, these, that these paintings are moving and responding to this young man, <laughs> excuse me, Rockwell included that image from the museum guide where this same painting seems um, much more serious and, and sedate here. So um, the last image that I wanted to show you from this museum section here is uh, features a museum that maybe some of you have attended at some point in your life. This is the Higgins Armory Museum in Worcester, Massachusetts, or at least that was the inspiration for this painting. It's a museum that is no more. Um, it was at one point the second largest armor collection in North America, but it was shut down um, not too long ago and its collection, I think mostly went to the Worcester Art Museum. But if you had the chance to ever visit the Higgins before it shut down, it was it, it just a, a, a uh, really sort of a visual splendor because the interior of the building looked like it was a medieval hall and it was just lined with all of these suits of armor and these recreations of horses and, and figures on top of those horses. So what we see in this image that was created for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in 1962. Uh, this is a full-size charcoal, charcoal sketch uh, for the finished cover that we see over here on the right. Um, we see in both of these images, um, the watchman for the museum, the night watchman, they play on words, right? The night watchman who's taking a little break and he's perched up on the pedestal right alongside, you know, these gallant knights, these, these uh, you know, presumably these great heroes from the past. And there's really nothing heroic about him. He's this uh, sort of a, a, a runt of a man whose feet are hanging off the pedestal here. Uh, and, um, and he seems completely unaware of of, of this grand setting that he's in. He's doing this kind of humble task of pouring his coffee and he's going to eat this piece of cake on his lap. Notice that he has thrown his jacket over the foot of this knight. Uh, that includes uh, the um, timepiece that he would use to keep his time as, um, as an employee at the Higgins and his flashlight. That's the closest thing he has to weaponry to defend this place. So, um, so it stands in stark contrast to all of these suits of armor and all of the presumed heroism that was involved with these knights of, of long ago. But Rockwell's joke here is of course that the statue of this horse has kind of come alive and that we see this bulging eye here. Maybe he's looking down at the front of this uh, night watchman's uh, jacket or perhaps he's just looking at the cake here. You never, it, it works both ways, doesn't it? You can never tell when it comes to Rockwell. So in um, one of our last sections, we'll sort of move quickly through this. This is a, a section where Rockwell is making visual quotations of other works of art. And I always imagine that this must be an interesting challenge for artists. And when they do it well, it must be this great sense of accomplishment. So in this first picture, I'm gonna show you, it, doesn't make any sense. It is an April Fool's Day picture that Rockwell painted in 1948. He did a, a several of these, but basically it's this illogical mix of things from the man-made world, things from the natural world, in this case, all kind of combined in this antique shop. And there's so much to look at here, but I wanted to draw your eye to the fact that Rockwell has included none other than the Mona Lisa in the lower left-hand corner here. Um, Leonardo da Vinci's masterwork from 1503. And in this case, um, he he reversed the image and he also added a halo as though she was a saint. Interestingly, Leonardo da Vinci did not 
put halos on Jesus in the Last Supper or the disciples. So I don't know if Rockwell was sort of playing off of that or if this was just a simple way to add a mistake that people could find. Um, he also once said that he was sort of jealous of his students who would go to the Louvre in Paris and look at the Mona Lisa and have and sort of swoon over her, have a real emotional reaction when they saw her because Rockwell didn't necessarily feel that way when he was looking at, at significant works of art from the past. So he's playful here. He reverses the image. He also reverses his own signature and misspells his own name if you're trying to keep track of all of the things he, he makes wrong in this picture. But moving quickly along, I wanted to share this image here called the New Calendar. This is from 1956. We see Rockwell's ability to tell a great story um, in full force here because uh, uh, clearly the new calendar is uh, one that includes this beautiful pinup here. This uh, older man is very happy about that. <laughs> His eyes are sort of bulging and, um, and he still holds the hammer. We can tell he just put up the calendar. But then his wife stands behind him with this wonderful look of skepticism on her face and her hands on her hip and even a cat at her feet. Normally Rockwell like to include a dog um, because dogs are love and fidelity. You could almost imagine that for Rockwell, the cat signified the opposite of that. So this cat is also um, feeling a little prickly maybe about this new addition to the wall here. And you get the sense that this woman is about to take this, this calendar right down. But this isn't Rockwell just kind of um, dashing off his own idea of what a pinup might be. He was actually very good friends with a, a pinup artist named Gil Elgren. They had met uh, years earlier at a commercial artist convention and really hit it off. And this, let me tell you, this is one of Elvgren's most tame pictures of, of a woman from this time period. But the two artists sort of laughed about the fact that Rockwell's um, Rockwell's models were never quite as attractive as Elgren's models. And I think it, to some degree, I think Rockwell was okay with that. He was more comfortable with it, but he did have a chance. He, he created a chance for himself to paint a little bit like his friend over here by visually quoting him here. Now, one of his most famous pictures of all time is of course the triple self-portrait from 1960. And it's such a wonderful portrait. I'm just gonna sort of spell out what's happening here and then we'll get to the uh, visual quotations. Rockwell, of course, we see him from behind as we have in so many of the images of other artists working um, so that we can, so we're like those onlookers. So we are those gawkers. We are the hayseed critic that are going to offer up unsolicited advice, but we see him and his process here. And, and it's all a visual joke. He's leaning over to look into a mirror. We can see he's wearing glasses, but we can't see his eyes. His, it's like his vision is foggy here. And he does kind of look like a, a 90 pound weakling. He's got this uh, pipe sort of drooping from his mouth. And of course, the joke is that what he's painting does not align with the um, with with the reflection in the mirror. He's got his his pipe at this jaunty angle. And of course, he's not wearing glasses. He's looking dashing, sort of debonair. Notice that Rockwell has included a number of sketches too, pinned to this giant canvas here. So it's not in fact a triple self-portrait. There's many more self-portraits in here, but it's the visual quotations that I wanted to really draw your attention to in this case. Rockwell has included these other images pinned to his canvas to um, offer a as inspiration or guide for his own painting. And in this case, he has the work of Albert Durer, um, the work of Rembrandt. Uh, this, uh, he's created a painting that's very similar to a Picasso self-portrait um, and another work here that's very similar to uh, a Van Gogh self-portrait. So not only is he saying, these are the works that have inspired me, he is saying, I can paint just like Durer, Rembrandt, Picasso, and Van Gogh, and I'll include it all right here. And of course, the visual joke is that his self-portrait looks nothing like these other ones that have come before him, but 
he's showing off a little bit that he can paint just like them. So in this next work, we have that same composition that we've become sort of familiar with looking at an artist from behind so that we can see what he's working on. This was painted um, the same year. This is 1960. And at this point, um, we, we know that this isn't Norman Rockwell, but it is an artist for the Saturday Evening Post. And you can see that there's this whole array of Saturday Evening Post mastheads that he's considering, he's probably thinking about updating the masthead. And of course, it goes all the way back to the Pennsylvania Gazette, and it changes over time. I include this image here because, believe it or not, Norman Rockwell is visually quoting himself. This is a Norman Rockwell um, uh, previous cover that is sort of peeking out of, of this artist's desk. And so here is the original cover by Norman Rockwell. It's a wartime cover featuring this invented character called Willie Gillis. It's a really playful one where he has, where it's a blackout and he has in his, in his hands a pamphlet that says what to do in a blackout. He's clearly not even reading it because he knows exactly what to do in a blackout. Um, he's got a, a lovely female companion there. Um, the other image Image that is also identifiable here is a painting, a cover painting by an artist named J.C. Leyendecker. And J.C. Leyendecker was sort of like Norman Rockwell before Norman Rockwell. And he was very much Rockwell's um, mentor and almost like his idol. He really emulated his career. So he inserted one of uh, J.C. Leyendecker's famous baby covers for the Saturday Evening Post and just tucked it right in at the top of this work here. Um, now, uh, one of the last images from this section that I wanted to share with you is another museum image. And uh, you might be thinking, well, why isn't this in, in the museum section? I have it here in this section about quoting other works of art, because in this case, Rockwell is very carefully quoting some, um, some masterworks from the Chicago Art Institute and he's not making them come alive. This is a really different approach to quoting um, um, works of art. So this is a painting that's later in his career. It's from 1966, and he called it Sargent versus Picasso, uh, a John Singer Sargent painting over here on the left, and obviously Picasso, Pablo Picasso on the right. And what he's really doing is reflecting on the cultural revolutions that were happening in the 1960s. So we have a, a really sort of traditional notion of um, of femininity, of what it means to be a woman. We have a, a, a lady here who is concerned about her appearance so much so that she's got these curlers in her hair, uh, maybe preparing for an outing later in the day. She's wearing high heels. She's also a mother. Notice that her daughter and, and, the, and the baby doll here also have curlers in her hair. But this really speaks to kind of like a prescribed traditional role um, in American life. And she's looking back at a very um, traditional and conservative uh, approach to painting and also a, 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 a traditional notion of, of what beauty is and maybe what a woman's role is. Now contrast that to this young redheaded woman in the blue jeans. We don't see her face, but we see her contemplating a Picasso here, which represented a revolution in so many ways, at least in the art world, not necessarily for women, but um, but we have this, this wonderful contrast here. And Rockwell, not necessarily saying that one is, uh, is better than the other, but that these two things are coexisting at the same time in the 1960s. So we'll wrap up this section here with um, this last image uh, called Waiting for the Art Editor. And I just love this image so much. It's from 1970. We've got this kind of garish green color on the, on the wall. And we have this young, naive, sort of hippie who's um, who's brought his portfolio in to see the art editor. And it's like, he doesn't know what he doesn't know. So he is informally dressed. Notice his little bare toes are peeking out from underneath his um, his portfolio. And he's, you know, sitting with his back straight up, sort of gazing off into the distance with all this confidence. Meanwhile, um, 
a more seasoned artist, a friend of Rockwell's posed for this, wearing a pinstripe suit, looking completely professional, is kind of hunched over and assessing him, thinking like, is this the future of the, the career or this kid's really in for it? We don't know. But the star of the show really is this painting behind them. Rockwell is quoting here a painting by My Michelangelo. This is a figure from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, Rockwell's able to just kind of include it in one of his his regular old uh, regular old in one of his one of his um, commissions uh, and and I think it's just so remarkable when an artist can can make a quote like that and in this case I I think that the prophet Isaiah who we see here is kind of uh, presumably kind of looking down at this figure in much the same way with the same kind of uh, questioning curiosity and maybe a little bit of disdain that we see with the um, with the seasoned artist over here on the right. So we're gonna see a little bit more of Isaiah in just a moment, but we're um, switching gears into our last section now. And this is our section very quickly on art historical references. So it's not Rockwell necessarily quoting uh, specific images and inserting them into his own paintings. This is him looking at the history of art and using it as a guide for some of his commercial work. So this beautiful painting here is an ad for uh, General Electric that was done in um, the in the late 1920s. This is a 1926 painting. You can see this woman working at a table here. Um, the composition is very similar to uh, a well, famous format for the uh, Dutch Baroque artist Vermeer, who was working in the 1660s. So well before Rockwell's painting of here, but we can see, you know, the window on the left, the table that um, set up just underneath the window, and then a woman doing this kind of delicate work at the end of the table. Notice that the angle of these women's faces, their eyelids um, appear to be closed from our direction. It's so similar. I I have to imagine that, it, that Rockwell was um, was was looking very closely at Vermeer when he created this image over here. Now, what's really funny to me is that in order to create an ad for General Electric, he is showing us a woman who's actually filling her oil lamps here. She's disassembled all of that. And he's basically saying, you don't have to do this kind of heavy work, just get some electricity in your house. <laughs> so one other Vermeer painting that I believe he probably quoted um, is uh, this painting by Vermeer called The Milkmaid. This is also from the 1660s. And then over here on the right, we have a Rockwell ad called Fruit of the Vine from 1930. We have women in, um, in blue with head coverings here, that same composition with the table and the window and the light streaming down. And she's pouring milk on the left. And over here, she's pouring raisins out onto the table. So I, see, I think we see uh, some real visual similarities. Now, um, we, we can't talk about art historical references without talking about Rosie the Riveter, one of Rockwell's most beloved images from 1943. This massive woman with these big strong arms because of course she's using this heavy machinery. She, and she's doing this important work of supporting um, working in manufacturing to support the war effort during World War II. She is taking a break at this moment, eating her lunch. There's her lunchbox and her sandwich. And she's got this very proud pose, kind of looking down her nose with all of this confidence. Rockwell even gave her a little bit of a halo and he has her stomping on um, Adolf Hitler's autobiography, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Rosie the Riveter wants none of it. She is ready to stamp out fascism. And Rockwell, well, you might be wondering, where did he find a model with these kinds of arms? Where, uh, how, did, how, did, how did he get such a strong woman? Well, in this case, the model was, um, was in part Michelangelo once again. He's quoting um, the prophet Isaiah here. And, and Michelangelo loved muscles. He would add them to any figure, whatever he could. But he also painted these Old Testament prophets as these enormous figures because they had to be legible from the floor, roughly 70 feet below um, when um, they were painted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now, these Old Testament prophets also served as the visual foundation for all of the New Testament storytelling. So uh, Michelangelo made them big, made them significant because they're kind of bearing that weight there too. And in his mind, I think Norman Rockwell thought, well, 
Rosie the Riveter is kind of bearing this weight as well. She is um, this foundation for the war effort. So I'm going to make her um, as just as visually significant. And in the end, he had to invent muscles, just like Michelangelo did. Here is Rockwell with his actual model for Rosie the Riveter. You can see this woman has perfectly average sized arms. Rockwell had to take a little bit of artistic license there. So we'll wrap up um, his art historical references with one of his um, one of his better known images and I think a favorite for so many people. This is a painting called The Connoisseur painted in the early 1960s and of course featuring this kind of splatter drip painting that is so similar to the work of Jackson Pollock. In fact, I was giving this program um, a little bit earlier this month and somebody pointed out it almost looks like there's a JP right here for Jackson Pollock. But, um, but the joke here is sort of that same kind of joke that Rockwell's been using all along, the new versus the old. So this painting, well, by 1960, it's not even quite the revolution. Uh, uh, Jackson Pollock had been painting like this for more than a decade at this point, but it was still something that was um, unusual and sort of difficult for the average American to really understand. And so Rockwell gives us somebody um, who we see from behind, in this case, somebody who's assessing this work, a connoisseur, somebody who should be familiar with a work like this. But he seems like somebody who's a little bit old school, old school versus new school here. And just his, his, his clothing and maybe even his posture kind of speak to the fact that he's not entirely comfortable with this, um, even though there's a great deal of visual splendor here, isn't there? There's the color versus his, his gray. Um, so he uh, he is sort of like a, a vessel for, for the American public to kind of view these works. It's okay to be suspicious, but it's also okay to, to embrace it, to really see the beauty in it. Now, um, I mean, Norman Rockwell is like a million light years away from Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock was, um, was the it boy of the 1950s in terms of avant-garde art in America. And, and of course he became famous for creating these drip and splatter paintings where he would put the, paint, the um, canvas on the floor and walk around and, and use these kind of wild gestures in order to create paintings, um, these uh, completely abstract non-objective paintings. And so he became this figure in the art world. He was macho. He was like a cowboy from, um, from Wyoming and this tough guy, this real innovator. And I love these, the comparison of these images because um, Norman Rockwell sort of plays off of these famous images of Jackson Pollock at work, but he's not trying to be the tough guy. He's always ready for the joke. He's painting in his socks <laughs> and he's painting still with the pipe at, in, in his mouth. So so um, having some fun with making a Pollock style painting. Now, interestingly, um, Pollock, Jackson Pollock's contemporaries who looked at this cover by Norman Rockwell said inch for inch, Norman Rockwell's abstract painting that he created for this cover was every bit as good as Jackson Pollock. And I think that's really saying a lot. I think it speaks to um, Norman Rockwell's versatility, even though he stayed in one narrow lane throughout his career. So we'll wrap up very quickly with just one big idea. We've got this painting here uh, that's called Gilding the Eagle. And when I came across it, I just thought it's it just encapsulates Rockwell and what he was doing with art and what he was doing with uh, American life. Essentially, we see this, this folksy old guy here um, shining up something that's artful and he's doing it in, in a kind of a funny way. And it's something distinctly American too, right? So we know that, that, that Rockwell was using art as a subject in his paintings throughout his career, but he made it fun, he made it humorous, and he sort of spoon fed it to the American public. So this seems like the perfect way to wrap things up for us right now. And um, so I will end here and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about Rockwell and his interest in the art world. I'll start looking at the Q&A here. Karen says, in Roadblock, there's a woman in the car at the bottom of the painting who's almost looking at the artist. She's facing completely opposite away from everybody else. I just found it very interesting and I have no idea if she's a special person to Rockwell, do you know? 
great question. We can go back to the roadblock here. Um, she is a figure that sort of brings us into the painting, doesn't she? Right down here. Um, everybody else seems to be looking at the dog, although we do have this figure who's kind of laughing and pointing, but looking out at us. I'm not sure um, who the model was for that particular person off the top of my head. Um, it could have been Rockwell's wife at the time, but I'm I'm really not sure. Uh, she she had much darker hair, but I but maybe the face could have been a little bit of a, of the model there. Um, that's a great question, Karen. Great attention to detail. It's interesting that that Rockwell put her right there as like this person to kind of bring us into the picture. So thanks for asking about that. I'd have to dig around a little bit uh, more, do a little bit more research to get back to you on that one. Um, somebody asked, what is the long baton stick in the image with the Boy Scouts and the self-portraits? Uh, great question. This is an artist tool, and we can see it in so many of these works. Uh, this is what's called a mall stick, and this is something that an artist would use. They'd prop it up against their canvas, and they'd uh, rest their wrist against it to sort of steady their hand as they're painting. I always think of painting sort of like performing surgery. And if you have shaky hands, it's going to mess up your, your uh, well, it's gonna mess up your surgery or your painting. So the mall stick is, um, you can see it has like this kind of like puff um, at the end, this kind of soft ball there to, um, to prop it against the, uh, the canvas uh, to not leave a mark, but to steady the artist's hand. And somebody asked, else asked, do you have any info on how he was commissioned to paint movie posters used in movie theaters? Oh, that aspect of his career, I'm not that familiar with. I know that comes a little bit later on, I think, when he's like painting people like John Wayne and that sort of thing. I do know that towards the end of his career at the Saturday Evening Post, they were more interested in him painting um portraits. So he started painting portraits of, um, of politicians and that sort of thing. And that was not really what, um, what he was passionate about doing. So that might have all kind of come in together. I don't, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I can't think of specific movie posters, but I think of him around that time as painting some celebrities. So maybe, maybe we're thinking about the same thing there. Um, Somebody asked, else asked, do you know if he was acquainted with Maxfield Parish? That is a great question. I actually don't know the nature of their relationship. I'm not sure if they ever met. I'm going to have to dive into that. I think I'm going to have to do a Maxfield Parish program for next year and, um, and get to the bottom of that one. But um, they were certainly aware of each other's work. I'm not sure there's um, too much visual sim similarity there, other than the fact that they they uh, created, you know, generally realistic paintings. But uh, Maxfield Parish was a, a little bit more eth ethereal, like neoclassical. Uh, uh, Norman Rockwell was just grounded in American life, but they their careers certainly overlapped each other in terms of time, and they were both so successful. There's there's really no way they couldn't have known about each other. But that's a great question, and I hope to have more information on you, on it for you um, by next year. And um, Theo asked, did he have children, and did they paint? Um, Norman Rockwell ended up having four, uh, three sons, and I'm not sure, I, I, I don't know that any of them became professional artists, but I do know that one of them helped him out significantly with his autobiography. So um, they were close and connected to him, but, I, but I'm not sure they ever became painters in their own right. That's a, that's a great question. And um, and I think we've covered them all. Thank you everybody for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. If you um, are interested in, in more talks from me, you can always go to imculturallycurious.com and I have a calendar page on my website. You can see other free Zoom programs like this one and, um, and next month's featured program for the Amesbury and the Chelmsford Library is um, Seaside Escapes, the Art and Art architecture of the New England coastline. So that should be a really fun one. And I, I hope to see you all there. Thanks for the kind words that are coming in. I always appreciate those. And I hope to see you again in the near future. Have a great night, everybody. Take good care. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. That was awesome. A really great talk. Um, we hope to see you all August 24th for Seaside Escapes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye.